The book of Daniel is a fascinating and puzzling read with dreams and strange visions uh, filling nearly every chapter. And there is a theme that emerges once and then reappears again later in the book. It is the pattern of human beings exalting themselves above God and living like beasts and then coming to ruin as a result. But there's also a great promise in the book of the prophet Daniel, and that is that God will come back and will confront us beastly human beings and redeem us and this world. And this is what we get in our first reading today. It is the promise being fulfilled. When all seems dark and everything seems lost, St. Michael, the great prince of all the angels, will come in power and will send out his angels to sweep up all the holy ones and gather them to glory. This message, this message of God uh, grabbing his people and redeeming them and bringing them back never gets old. We human beings can easily turn to beasts in a heartbeat. In a moment, we can become manipulative and power hungry and jealous and start to degrade others just because things aren't going our way. I mean, it's amazing. You can be driving down the Lloyd Expressway, things are going well, then somebody cuts you off and all of a sudden this animal just emerges. And we can think to ourselves like, what just happened? Like, who am I? Where did that come from? It's interesting, in the book of Daniel, this happens to two kings, Nebuchadnezzar and his son, Belshazzar. That's a popular name. It's coming back. Trust me. People are going to be naming their kids that in the next 10 years. Belshazzar doesn't learn from his dear old dad, Nebuchadnezzar, who realizes he has become a nasty beast. In fact, he literally becomes a beast. He starts to crawl on all fours. He starts to eat grass. His hair grows out. He's just this nasty, gnarly person. And then suddenly his reason returns to him and he calls out to the Lord in repentance. Belshazzar doesn't do that. And it ends very differently for them. Belshazzar ends up being assassinated while his dad was restored as king. And this is the big point in the book of the prophet Daniel. Repentance leads to restoration. Specifically, our repentance back to God restores our royal role in the family of God. We rediscover our dignity when we turn back to God with sincerity of heart. This is what God wants for us. He wants to lift us up and help us to remember who we are. Next week, before we uh, get a fresh start with the season of Advent, we celebrate the solemnity of Christ the King. It's important for us, I think, to look at how the King of the universe restores our dignity as his beloved daughters and sons. He doesn't do it through great power, but he does it through great humility. He doesn't do it like Belshazzar, but he does it like Nebuchadnezzar. Christ becomes a beggar for us. He takes on the neediness of our flesh, the weight of our humanity, and over and over again humbles himself in front of his father out of obedience to him. This is how he saves us. This is how he restores our dignity. The offering that he makes to the Father for our salvation and for the salvation of the world is himself humbled and even humiliated. We hear this in our second reading today from the letter to the Hebrews. For by one offering he has made perfect forever those who are being consecrated. And friends, this 
is why we need the Eucharist. This is why we absolutely and desperately and definitively need the Eucharist because it is the offering of the Son to the Father. At this Eucharist, Jesus says to the Father, this is my gift to you. It is myself broken and humiliated uh, in order to save those whom you love. And I've been thinking about this a lot over the last couple of weeks, especially uh, at the retreat that I was on last weekend. And it started to change the way that I look at the Eucharist. Uh, and here's just a small example of what I mean. Uh, after the consecration, when I raise up the host that has been consecrated and I raise up the chalice, my eyes used to always go to the host and the chalice just because it seems like that's where they would naturally go, acknowledging Christ present in the Eucharist. But over the last couple of weeks, it's interesting. I don't know when this, why this started happening, but I started to look beyond the host and to look beyond the chalice, recognizing that this is the gift to the Father. Like when you give someone a gift, you don't look at the gift when you give it to them. You look at the face of the one that you're giving it to. And I find that that's what's been happening. Uh, it's a beautiful reminder of what this Eucharist is about. The entire Eucharist is a prayer to the Father. It's an offering to the Father of the Son. It's not something that we've done or accomplished. It's not our project or our, our good works that we're offering, but it's the sacrifice of Christ who is the only one who can reconcile us back to God. We say it just before the great amen. When we say through him, through Jesus, with him, with Jesus and in Jesus, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father. It is this this great moment of, of, of culmination when everything that we have been doing leads to this great offering to the Father and we say, amen, yes, I believe, it is true. Jesus is the one who saves us. His offering to the Father is the only offering that can take away sins and can reconcile us back to God. It's a beautiful moment. And this changes what it means for us to participate in the Eucharist fully and actively and consciously, as the Second Vatican Council reminded us. It does not mean that we are busying ourselves about or that everyone has a job to do at Mass, because that would be too focused on us. It means primarily that we are joining ourselves to Jesus. That in everything that we do, we are uniting ourselves to Jesus. And so we respond boldly and meaning what we say. We do it by singing and uniting our voice to the voice of Jesus as he cries out to the Father in love. We do it by acknowledging the presence of Christ in our brothers and sisters around us and seeking unity together so that we can be one body in Christ, healed of all division. I can't emphasize this enough, all of it, everything that we do in this place is for the sake of uniting ourselves to Jesus as he gives himself to the Father. Because that's how we're saved. That's how the Lord reminds us of who we are and what we're made for. This is so, I mean, you can see it. This is so dramatically different than people showing up and saying, I didn't get anything out of mass. It's different than people coming and grabbing communion and then running out the door. We are participating in something that has saved the world. Something that has given humanity a possibility that was before Jesus impossible. That's what we're celebrating here. 
It is a tremendous and beautiful gift that is given to us, that God has given to us. And so friends, let's think about what we're doing here. Let's be more conscious about our need to be saved from becoming beasts who try and exalt ourselves above God. This Eucharist is so absolutely beautiful because with genuine humility, we participate in the perfect offering of Jesus to the Father. It's his work. It's his work. And thanks be to God, it's our salvation. 